Welcome back, movie fans. This is Sequels Suck, the podcast all about prequels, sequels, remakes, and everything in between. And this week, we are talking, uh, at least from uh, our generation's point of view, a uh, doozy. And to do that, uh, we've gotten the band back together. Michelle is back. Hello, Michelle. How are you going? Hello. Good. How are you guys? Good. Good. It's good to see you back again. Uh, for, for the audio only, Michelle has geared up in the Beetlejuice jackets. Uh, looking ready to to get in in deep dive into something pretty amazing. Uh, it's great great to see you back here again, especially for something like this because I think this is one that uh, follows on from a movie, an original that's all, very near and dear to all of our hearts. Mm. Uh, but uh, I mean, look, this is this is a, an interesting day for all of us, and I think there's a lot to say about it. How how are you going, Cable? How are you doing, man? Yeah, good, good. I'm excited to talk about this movie, and I know. Michelle's very excited to talk about this movie, or at least is a massive fan of the original, so um, was definitely very keen and said, are oh, you going to be talking about Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice anytime soon? <laughs> Can I come on? <laughs> well, it's, it's, we're, all, we're all kind of dancing around it, but it's a good place to jump off. Like, what is our relationship to the original? Because this is sort of a movie that over time has just gotten stronger and stronger and stronger, especially as pop culture has gotten more and more mainstream as the, you know all of us 80s and 90s kids have grown up and now have disposable income to spend on shiny things like our own personal copies of the handbook for the recently deceased and everything in between. <laughs> so how, when, when did it come into our, when did you first experience Beetlejuice, Michelle? I like honestly can't remember. It's one of those movies that I just don't remember seeing, but it's definitely in my top 10 favourite movies. But I have no mm. recollection of seeing it for the first time. It would have been on VHS, like, back in the day. But it's like Hocus Pocus. It's one of those movies where I feel like I was the only one that ever saw it and knew about it. Like, <laughs> in my head, it was like some sort of movie that I made up. Yeah, I cannot remember seeing it for the first time. Yeah, I feel like that's... Uh, most people our age probably start to feel that way what about you cable do you do well you only because i've got a couple of years on you two um <laughs> i i remember it being advertised being at the cinemas like i again very small because and, and you know when i say that maybe more so when it hit video i remember it being a big deal um but i remember seeing it vh vhs probably the year it came out so i would have been about nine years old when it came out and saw it very early on from a pirated copy. Oh. I, won't oh. I won't name the family <laughs> member, but someone had a copy of it very early on and it was a pirated copy. And, uh, yeah, so I, was, I saw it very early on. So I was very um, enamored with the film because it was something different that I hadn't seen before. Well, it, that's, that nails it. This movie really, when I first started watching it with VHS, uh, I definitely, there were some pirate copies passed around from family members and, and older friends, older brothers and things. It was just one of those movies that if someone had it, they shared it because like, you got to check this movie out. The, what I remember very, very vaguely about Beetlejuice is I'm pretty sure I saw it after Batman because I was a big Batman yeah. kid, loved yeah. Tim Burton's Batman. <laughs> and I remember my mum trying to explain to me as she showed me Beetlejuice, that's Batman. And I was like, you're crazy. And she's yeah. like, no, it's the same guy. And for years, I was like, mum is completely out of her mind because there is no way that the guy who is that weird monster is also Batman. And then as I got older, people tried to explain, it's the same director. I'm like, you're all crazy now. There's no way that that's true. Because Beetlejuice is, it's, it's hard to really wrap your head around it in 2024. But Beetlejuice was so different from everything else. Yeah. It was. It's like a haunted house movie, but it's not. It's a monster movie, but it's not. It's a kids movie, but it's not. Like it, you can watch it as a child and be like, "Yeah, that's for kids." And you can watch it as an adult and go, "Kids should not watch this." No. Like it's so. It, 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 I hate that term genre bending. I think it's really cliched, but this I think is kind of the exception because, what genre is this movie? No, I think it's a Tim Burton genre. I just think it's yes. a lot of that stuff is his visual style. And like I said, it probably started out originally as a horror slash haunted house type film with ghosts and, and obviously looking into the recently departed. Um, but yeah, a lot of the stuff, obviously the sandworm and a lot of that stuff is just crazy stuff straight from Tim Burton's imagination and his years at Disney and doodling around and, and drawing all these different crazy concepts. And when I rewatched it 
recently I was kind of, yeah, couldn't believe how much, yeah, it does feel very comic-y, cartoony enough that you go, oh, it's 100%. It's just like, he's like, what can I put on film? Well, I, I can imagine him being in the studio just, well, you know, I, I think, I don't know if everyone knows this, but Tim Burton in a previous life before he was a director was a cartoonist for Disney. So I can imagine him being at that table doing what he was supposed to do, but also on the side or when he's finishing, you know, those sort of extra hours just doing his own little things and that's just translated straight into Beetlejuice. Yeah, well, it's interesting you said cartoony. I think a lot of people forget there is a Beetlejuice cartoon. That mm, came yes. The yes. It's one of those many, 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 many uh, not-for-kids movies that somehow spawned a kids' cartoon series like Robocop or... Mm. Ace Ventura, or things or like aliens. that. Aliens. Oh, what? Is there well, that's an what they were, cartoon? Well, that's what they were, well, they were trying to do an Aliens cartoon, which sort of ties into those toys that we talked about or that you had from the Aliens film. Oh, there was God. That was what they were trying to sort of branch into, yeah. I don't think it ever got off the ground, but yeah. Anyway. Thank God. Too many traumatized children. <laughs> so that that's 88. Now we flash forward all the way to 2024. And for, I feel like, my whole adult life. So I would say for the last like 22 years, I have been hearing rumors that there is going to be a Beetlejuice too. Did you guys hear the, any uh, throughout our time on the internet as, as we'll grow up, did you hear any of the proposed ideas for Beetlejuice two over the years? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sure you'll tell me one that um, will come back and hit me like a ton of bricks when you say it, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But I know, Do you know there's Michelle? definitely some concepts. No. And I know it's one of those sequels. It's a bit like before they ever went back and did Ghostbusters, there was always um, Harold Ramis and Ivan Reitman had an idea for the third one that just sat in, I guess. Yeah, Ghostbusters go to hell. Yeah, and it literally sat in hell, just, just waiting to be made and never got off the ground. And, I mean, it's one of, uh, yeah, I've definitely heard Beetlejuice being thrown around a f- quite a few times over the years, but uh, what it was going to be about, don't know, couldn't tell So you the one that persisted it. the most, yeah. that became it almost became like an urban legend, that they, oh, they're going to make a Beetlejuice sequel, was Beetlejuice to Hawaii. Oh, yes, I have. It was going to be yeah. Beetlejuice in Hawaii, and that, that was... That was basically the premise. They didn't re- ever really reveal much more of a story. Apparently, they kicked around that idea. The screenwriters sort of played with the idea to be like a piss take of 50 surf movies, but instead of like, you know, the the tough thugs from the wrong part of town coming to the beach, it was fucking Beetlejuice shows up and just wreaks havoc on the beach, which I think is a sick idea. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that. <laughs> yeah, and it, it sort of became almost like this impossible dream that we were going to get a second Beetlejuice sometime, somewhere, somehow Beetlejuice 2 is coming in some form. And then it, it really just looked like it wasn't going to happen because Tim Burton fell into this. And we'll talk about this a bit, but he fell into this spiral of just remakes and weird adaptations that he didn't seem to ever get out of. Keaton. I think Keaton is now on like his sixth comeback. Like he just keeps disappearing to straight to video and then returning with, you know, Birdman. And then, you know, it's easy to forget he was in Birdman and Spotlight backs. He was in the Best Picture winners two years in a row. Mm-hmm. And then he still kind of went away again for a little bit after that. And now he's back with, with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. It all seems so impossible and so improbable this movie was going to happen. When it finally did happen, to find out not only we were getting Tim Burton and Michael Keaton, but we were also getting Winona Ryder and Catherine O'Hara coming back and that it was going to be set in the same house again and it was going to follow these characters in the next phase. When you first found out that was a plot, how did you guys feel about that before seeing the movie when you found out we're, we're getting the gang back together? Michelle, how did that hit you? I was excited because it's one of my favourite movies, but you always go into it quite apprehensively because it's been, what, 36 years? Mm, and yeah, not, it's all, been a run. not all sequels that come out that long after do mm. well, except for Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. How, how did you feel about a Cable when you first heard it? Well, it's it? funny that uh, Michelle brings up Top Gun Maverick because I think that's one of the movies. The fact that that was so successful, I would say... And it's similar to another movie we talked about a few weeks ago, Twisters. Like, I think they're like, people like, oh, hang on. People might come back to these movies that have this nostalgia. And that's why I think another reason maybe why Beetlejuice was greenlit as well, that it, it's like, 
oh, well, Top Gun Maverick brought back all the key elements. We can do this. This is a cult film. If we make it on a reasonable budget, we can make some money back. Um, as long as we're not tipping $300 million into it like an Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, I think it's it, the chances of it, even if it sort of is not a great movie, you're still going to recoup your money and get your money back. But, um, yeah, I think bringing, bringing – Mostly the band back. There's someone definitely missing from the <laughs> from the band for a reason. But, but um, there's there's two someone's missing from it. We'll get into that as but, well um, because I got some uh, thoughts about that. Yeah. Um. So I think yeah, it was yeah, like Michelle. I think you, you, there's this apprehension, like you're like, oh, you don't want it to be a cash grab. You don't want it to be sour your memories of the first one or be a really bad story and not a good logical next step. Uh, but um. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I was wrapped that they were doing it. And then you put Jenna Ortega in there as well, who's one of the hottest things in Hollywood at the moment, and it sort of makes a lot of sense. And did how, how do we see it? I mean, I'm assuming we all saw it in a cinema. Yes. Everyone's going to out themselves as some <laughs> sort of horrible, horrible pirate. Um, I, I saw it. I was, in a, I was a, working in uh, Shepparton. I was working in Shepparton. There's a small theatre there. I went in. It was one of the most full theaters that I've been to in quite a while. Mm. I was surprised. Like not like the good old days. Not like the nineties when it, well, you know, pre COVID. You know, yeah, like two in the afternoon was sold out. But it was <laughs> pretty full for a Wednesday night in Shepherd. And I went so with a friend who, as we were driving to the cinema, said, "I've never seen Beetlejuice. Do mm. I need to have seen Beetlejuice to see the sequel?" And I said, "I haven't seen the sequel. I don't know <laughs> if you yeah. need to see it." <laughs> so I, I I spent a lot of the movie kind of like watching it but also being like is yeah this, is this ruining <laughs> something for my friend am i am i yeah. doing a bad thing by this being the first version of beetlejuice that mm -hmm. i allow someone to see um how, did you guys have good viewing experiences going into it yeah i was vmax oh ah, nice, oh, nice. Yeah. no i yeah. just went to one of the smaller cinemas it wasn't super busy but i went on like opening night but yeah there oh, weren't wow. many people there and have we all just seen it once at this stage? Yes. Wow. All right. Interesting. Well, then let's let's actually get into the movie Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. Actually, yeah, it's crazy. We haven't really spoken about the sequel yet. Fucking <laughs> great <laughs> title. I know I get called yes. on yes. them all yep. the time. I get hooked up. Fucking great title. I was so happy with this title. I love that they let you know Tim Burton and the crew go with it. I love they didn't bitch out and do two semicolon mm -hmm. Return of the Juice or some bullshit. It just the juice is loose. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> nah. Just nah, finally, I, I actually did wonder what you were thinking, and I sort of thought you'd be more positive on this name. I, I think it's it works because it is the second movie, obviously, but the fact of the, the whole thing of him having his, to activate, I guess, Beetlejuice, you have to say his name three times, mm -hmm. and to have it, like, two times, I think it just that works so good. Because, I mean, if they come back for a third one, it's Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Like, it's not... Well, you see, I think... I was thinking about this. If they do yeah. make a third one, yeah. I hope that they call it Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Yeah. Because you can't <laughs> say it three times because yeah. then he shows up. Um, yeah. And how, how are we feeling? Like, we're a couple of days removed from seeing it. We've had some time to sit with it. We've had some time to feel the hype. What's what's the vibe? Michelle, how do you, how do you, what do you think of Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice? Not good is the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> it finished and I think I said I think I hated that wow and I don't know if hates the word but very strongly disliked was the vibes what what was wow. the thing what was the thing that they either did or did not do that like made you feel that way in this one because I, I think I, it was just so much story crammed into one movie yep so many characters that they didn't flesh out that didn't really need to be there the ending was just a bit lackluster. The songs weren't amazing. Like Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice was amazing. Like he still got it, but the rest was just a bit of a letdown. And I tried to go in with really low expectations. Like my friend saw it at a preview and said, this is the best sequel they could make. So that might've swayed me a little bit, but I tried to go in very low expectations, just to enjoy it for what it is. And then no, it didn't happen. Mm. <laughs> Table, how did you feel walking out? Um, better than Michelle. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I have a confession. I So I've always loved Beetlejuice. When, like I said, I saw it when I was about nine, so it was the most amazing thing. 
I'd seen when I was a kid and, and most out there thing. And it was one of those ones that I watched quite regularly. And then when it came out on VHS, I'm sure I had it. And then DVD. But I don't reckon I'd watch the original for a good 10, 15 years, maybe even almost 20 years. Wow. And so I went back and watched it the other day for the first time leading into this. And I was like, really? I'm like, I actually was like, I don't love this movie. It's like, wow. It, it, you know, Michelle said she had it in her top 10, wouldn't even crack my top 50. Like, I was like, I actually watched it and I laughed once. Like, obviously, when they do the Banana Boat song, um, that is still one of the best scenes in the movie. But I was like, I am I loved it as a kid and maybe I've just grown up. It's just like, it's not a movie I would re-watch ever again. And so wow. going into this one, <laughs> Yeah, oh, I know. I've just wow. lost about how Lots many subscribers are we going to lose now? <laughs> There's going to be no everyone who likes this well, that, show. Well, that's my juice, well, sure. that's my controversial take because I, I, I again, it's like you know, there's you know, there's a, a million movies I loved as a kid that just haven't really stuck with, and there's others like Empire and um, The Goonies and that that I can watch all the time and never have an issue and never have any doubts about how much I love that film, but. Beetlejuice is one that just the the glosses just over the years just just gone. I just yeah. I think Michael Keaton's still great in it. When I own is great in it. I think the cast is great in the movie. I just I for me it's now overrated. <laughs> and um, so unlike Michelle, I went into the sequel with low expectation, thinking, well, I'm not so enamoured with the original anymore that this should be a step up. And I enjoyed this one quite a bit actually but I absolutely agree with Michelle there was too many characters they they tried to put too much stuff in there they either needed to get rid of the character of um uh um uh, the wife the ex-wife well, yeah Monica uh Monica Bellucci yeah Bellucci the wife, the wife. Or, or um uh Willem Dafoe they had to make I think they had to cut one of those characters out mm-hmm. I think there was you're giving us too much now and then because you're trying to have Jenna Ortega have her side story, Winona, and then Justin Theroux's got their story going on. Catherine, it was you're right, it was too much. They had to try and find a way to maybe cut one of those side stories or characters out. Um, do you yeah, not I, agree, Angus? Yes, I, I couldn't agree yeah. more that there's too. In fact, I go further. They should have. Not only could they or, or, or could they have cut out one, they should have cut out the wife and they should have cut out Willem Dafoe and they should have cut out the weird ghost boyfriend and they should have cut out Justin Theroux and they should have made Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice a fucking Beetlejuice movie because yes. it's not. Uh, I think I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of the two of you, mm. probably leaning a bit more towards the Michelle end. I found myself the entirety of this movie being taken out of it by all of the decisions they were making that just confused and sometimes infuriated me and having to actually say to myself as I was watching the movie in the cinema, come on, man, just enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Come on, yeah. you can do it. You can just enjoy it. <laughs> just enjoy it for what it is. Come on, man. Look, we're watching a Beetlejuice movie. Isn't that great? And I was like, yeah, you're right. Come on, let's just have fun. Watching I, the whole movie, I was like, I have ruined Beetlejuice, my friend, Lauren, who was watching it with me. I was like, she's never going to watch it, and I feel so bad. And at the end of it, she turned to me and was like, that was really fun. I had a great time. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> maybe part of it is what we're discovering with Cable and my friend. Maybe if you don't have a, a relationship to the first one or not a strong relationship, mm-hmm. maybe you could have gotten on board more with this. Like, I, I'm with you. I think, I don't know for certain, but Beetlejuice could certainly, is a contender for my top 10. Like, I have a fucking sandworm tattoo. I, I love Beetlejuice a lot. <laughs> And I love Michael Keaton a lot. He's one of my all-time favorite actors. What I also knew going into this movie is that I have a, a, a firmly held belief that Tim Burton has forgotten how to make movies. I think he is an incredible fucking visionary. I think he's an amazing artist. He's responsible for some of my favorite movies of all mm-hmm. time. But those movies are like his first nine movies. Yeah. And then if you look at the latter part of his career, he is steadily just devolved into making some truly strange choices from the weird down to the outright terrible. Uh, and most of them uh, are incredibly strange choices in that for a guy who we look at as like, he's this weird outside of this crazy guy. He did Edward Scissorhands. He did Beetlejuice. The majority of his career is remakes and adaptations. He does the <laughs> least creative thing with most of the films he makes. Mm-hmm. And so I, I really wasn't sure I was going to get something good with this, not because 
I didn't think a good sequel to Beetlejuice could be made because I didn't think he could make it. I think this is the best film Tim Burton has made in a long time. I don't think that that is saying much, unfortunately. Um, from, from where I sit, like I think since Sleepy Hollow, it's been pretty steadily spiralling. And this is probably just under Sleepy Hollow in terms of what films I would enjoy, which still puts it quite far down his list. Um, the storyline is the big thing that I keep coming back to. I can't get past the fact that we do have, we have a, a dead wife out for revenge. We yes. have a, a ghost cop who is not actually a cop, but an actor who played yeah. a cop in life, who now is a cop in death, but isn't really a cop. Yes. We have a boy who is actually a ghost. So General Tager can see ghosts, but just one ghost, who also is a murderer mm -hmm. who needs to steal her soul. We have a producer who is also Winona Ryder's kind of boyfriend who wants to marry her, who just wants her for her money, which is blatantly obvious and plays a twist. We have two, two different dads die in water from water animals. We have a dad dying from piranhas eating him, and we have a dad yeah. dying from a shark biting his head off. Mm -hmm. We have Catherine O'Hara trying to do whatever she can with what she's got, which frankly is not much. And we have Winona Ryder completely lost in this movie. I think she I don't think she was given a day's direction on this movie, to be honest. I think the ad she was like, Oh no, you know what you're doing, you're great. And then Tim Burton went off to make out with Monica Bellucci a lot. Which, if nobody knows, Tim Burton oh. and Monica Bellucci are a couple, which is why she's wow. in this movie. Yes. Oh. Tim Burton puts his girlfriend See, I'm, in the I, movie. I, I like to think I'm up to date with all these relationships in Hollywood. I did not even know that because I was about to say, where's Helen Bond and Carter? Like, I didn't see her in this movie. Which because was on... they broke up and now it's Monica Bellucci. Like, yeah. Right. That's weird because, uh, no offence, but Tim Burton is not an attractive I, guy. I don't, never has I been, never will be. Okay. He, yeah. He's got to have something because he keeps <laughs> he's incredibly amazing women who not only are beautiful but are just like fascinating, powerful, well, I mean, independently Mo wealthy. Oh, 100%. And women. Monica, <laughs> I don't get and Monica for a long time has always been in that sort of top 10 sexiest women in Hollywood slash in film and you're like, yeah, that's bizarre to me, but... It is. So <laughs> so you, I think we're, we're all kind of on the same page with the storylines. It's interesting how the way we're responding to it is playing out because I, I think you could take most of the storylines out of this movie and it would actually make it significantly better. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what the point of the wife being in is. Just to get the backstory, I think, of how Beetlejuice became Beetlejuice. But did you ever watch Beetlejuice and wonder what happened to him? How did he become... Beetlejuice because that never crossed my mind. No, in fact, when they did that backstory, mm -hmm. I groaned out loud in the cinema and said, "Please don't." Verb <laughs> like out loud, I said, "Please don't," because they did. This is this is the John Carpenter school of filmmaking. The worst thing you can do with a monster is explain it. Yeah. Also, it contradicts. So, like it, it took me out of the movie so hard. It's like, all right, so because he was spoke... a human man. He's meant to be a, a parademon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's not a human. He's a demon. But. Mm. No, he actually was a human who died and then became a de Like, how is he so different to every other dead person in the underworld if he was just another dude? Mm -hmm. Like, why explain that and not the rest of it? And in the weird black and white, like, and they, speaking in another language. Well, so or that's, are they speaking Subtitles? Spanish? No. Italian, Italian. Italian. So that's, Italian. That's Tim Burton doing like an homage to like old gothic Mario yeah. Bava films because yeah. in every movie he has to reference other movies. He's like the mm. he's like the original Tarantino in that sense. And like if you yeah. look at all these movies, he's really making a movie about another style of movie mm. that he liked. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, it a baffling and horrible choice. I think to a do that. It, it comes literally out of nowhere in the movie. Mm. Like, he just grabs the microphone and starts speaking Italian, which at first I was like, that's pretty funny that for no reason Beetlejuice is just being dubbed in Italian. <laughs> okay, cool. Like, why not? Mm. And then it goes to the black and white flashback, and I was like, fuck. Mm -hmm. Fuck, fuck, why? What's the twist? <laughs> Come on. No, there's no mm. twist. He no. just used to be human. And, the, and also now she can suck souls, which means you're dead but forever dead. But then they never do anything with that. 
then she does weird stuff like pop up in a dry cleaners, but she never seems to actually be hiding the rest of the time. It's just that one. I don't. In the end, like the payoff was just so shit. Like she finds him, but she didn't even try to suck his soul. Nothing really happened. And then she was just eaten by a sandworm. And you're it's like, quite literally a Deus Ex Machina ending. They just like happen to open the book to the page. Like, oh, if we draw a square on the ground, it'll take us to the sandworms even though that's never been mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And the only other time people draw a door, it takes you to the underworld, not to the sandworms. Uh, what the, what the <laughs> fuck? And the, the boyfriend's reveal two seconds before that. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I was actually only with you for the money and I never had a dead fiance. It's like, well, obviously that was obvious, mm -hmm. but also there was no stakes mm -hmm. because what was like, it's not like, okay, take Adam's family values. For example, mm -hmm. you, know, you have uh, Joan Cusack who wants to marry uh, Festa because mm -hmm. she wants the family fortune, and there's this whole thing about it. We never know what this guy's motives are because they're never explained. Because he's spending the whole time just trying to be a douche in a really weird way. Uh, did Did you guys like Justin Theroux in this movie? No, no, it was so <laughs> unnecessary. I don't know how to explain this, but I feel like this movie, and maybe I'm totally misreading the first movie, the original, um, because I feel like a lot of that movie was still played straight and it was less, as an audience we would laugh. This movie, I felt like there was times when it was supposed to be serious, yet they played it sh like like for laughs. Like stupid like, things? Yeah, so like I can understand when they're in the afterlife we see – like, you know, the guy with the missing leg or the shark on his leg and, and all this other stuff is like this comedic, you know, eye candy, but also there's stuff played more for laughs. But then when she's explaining to Winona um, that her father's died and they have that whole conversation, it's like ridiculously comedic for a very sombre and sad moment. And I was like, what are they doing here? I'm like, am I dreaming this? Like, and that's where I thought, I'm like, I don't know what they think. I'm confused as to what's happening in this movie because I feel like there's times when, it, yes, play it straight, and then mm -hmm. there's times where it can be funny. And I'm like, I think try and leave the com the comedy up to Michael Keaton and Beetlejuice. Yeah. Don't have the real characters have a conversation where it's that comedic about someone dying, because that's just it. That just totally threw me that right from the get go. I was like, that's the weirdest conversation to tell your daughter or your stepdaughter mm -hmm. that her father's dead. So much of this movie, that scene, <laughs> every scene with Justin Theroux, yeah. it, felt he, like yeah. an, it felt like an SNL sketch yes. about Beetlejuice. Like everything felt like a parody of Beetlejuice instead mm. of Beetlejuice. The, where was the... Nobody in the movie seemed to take themselves <laughs> seriously. And you're right, in the first one, they do. Like, yes, Lydia Dietz is fucking insane in the first movie, but she's insane in a way where she truly believes what she's saying, what she's doing. She is committed to who she is. They are weird, not because they are playing weird. They are weird because they are city people who have come to this small country town mm -hmm. and want to bring their insane New York art scene vibe to this quaint little country house. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the, the sort of the tension of that movie. No one is wrong. They're just different. In this movie, no one is different for starters. They're all the fucking same. Mm -hmm. It's like the producer, Lydia, uh, fucking um, Catherine O'Hara's character, they're all like the same p person, basically. Yeah. And they're all running at 100. But there's also no, there's no tension because there's no ghosts in the house for them to fight against. Mm -hmm. The tension is meant to come from Winona Ryder and General Ortega. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I'm pretty sure they have one scene where they actually talk to each other and that's when they're on the bench in the cemetery yep. and that's like five sentences mm -hmm. and we're meant to infer as an audience that they have this incredibly troubled relationship that they've never gotten past the, the father figure in the family and that Winona Ryder really is like horrible to be around or this like they're both mm -hmm. so flat and then they just don't share a scene again except for the car ride to the boys house which is also one line and it's kind of relaxed and nice yeah. Like, she's like, where are you going? He's like, I'm coming to meet the parents. And she's like, no, you don't have to do that. I'm not a kid. He's like, oh, right. Yeah, sorry. Well, be safe. And it's all yeah. like, 
<laughs> There's no tension in that relationship. Those two like each other. I think General Tag and Winona Ryder as people like each other too much because yes. they really got along on this movie. Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out as I go. But what, uh, Michelle, you like the original a lot more than Cable. Mm-hmm. Does this have the same feel at all no. to Beetlejuice? No, I. He did, like Beetlejuice did. But he's the only. Like, even the underworld felt different. To, did that feel different to you as yeah, well? It felt think... goofier. Yes. I mean, oh, look, I mean, I, I don't want to jump well, ahead, but all the, one bo- part. all the bobs, all the. I didn't mind that. That was fun because yeah. I guess that was kind of contained within the Beetlejuice world. Mm-hmm. Like Beetlejuice and his bobs felt like one thing. I was like, that's funny. But the, I mean, the fucking Soul Train is oh, one that, of the worst no. things I've ever seen in yes. a movie in my entire life. So unnecessary. <laughs> and I but mean, what is it? T- what is it telling us? I don't. I don't it's, really I'll tell you what it's telling us. It's telling us that in the afterlife, there is a separate place for black people because the yes. only place there's any black people in the afterlife is when they're wearing afros and dancing. Yeah, that's at the soul train. train. There's no other black people in the movie. They're and all there. I, I don't want to make this a race thing or a woke thing. I don't know, but it felt like that as soon as I saw it. I. I like the play on the word gag, but then I'm like, that makes zero sense to start off with. Mm-hmm. Then they're all on the platform dancing, like, and I'm like, but are they dead? Are they going on the soul train to get to the net? Like, it was made zero sense. And then I'm like, oh, are they meeting their quota of African American content in this film by having that scene in it? And but did you notice who the train uh, the train conductor was? Was it Stephen K. Amos? It was Stephen K. Yeah, Amos. Yeah, the comedian yes. Stephen K. Amos. I'm like, I know that guy. Yeah, yeah, great um, to see him in a movie. Look, great, great to see lots of people in this movie, but lots of people given nothing to do. And that scene is so weird because I, I didn't like the cinematography of this movie, honestly. I felt like it was really awkwardly shot. I feel like the cinematographer had their idea and Tim Burton had his idea and they just didn't meet in the middle. Because that when they're doing that big dance scene the first time, because they do the train gag twice, mm. first time they do it, there's this big dance number going on. I was like, fuck it. I love seeing big dance numbers in movies. Even if I don't like the scene, even if I'm not having a great time, I love watching great choreography on the big screen. It's one of cinema's great joys. It's why I miss big musicals so much. Like you watch the old musicals and every 10 minutes, there's like 60 people doing the most absurdly complicated dance scene down New York's Fifth Avenue. And you're like, fuck, cinema is amazing. Look what you can do. So when we got a dance number, I was like, all right, I'm 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 in. Let's watch two minutes of a dance number. I'm happy. It like, keeps cutting off heads and moving in weird angles and you don't actually see any of the dancing. It's kind of like the, the direction was like, no, nah, don't fucking worry about the dancing. The mm-hmm. gag is it's a train and we're saying Soul Train and there used to be that show in the 60s called Soul Train. Mm-hmm. So it's that. At, who is that joke for? Because the people who remember yeah. it don't care. And the people who are too young to not know what it is are just going to be sitting there going, like the general Taker fans must have been sitting there going, what is this? What the fuck is going on? And am I wrong, but were all the people on the Soul Train, they were just dressed like 70s yes. Soul Train. Like they weren't, where's their de- like cause of death? Like everyone in the afterlife, you can see they've had their head chopped I off mean, my, or whatever. My friend did have a good theory that they all just died of all the cocaine they took in the clubs in the 70s. And I was like, well, that, yeah, that kind <laughs> yeah, of makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Maybe if we freeze frame it, a few of them will just have like a bit of blood. <laughs> Um, but that scene as well, like, again, this goes to something that is a larger problem, I think, with this movie. In fact, I think the largest problem. When uh, General Tager is getting put on, when Astrid is getting put on the train to be taken to the afterlife, Winona Ryder just walks on and takes her off. Like, nothing is stopping her from getting off. She just doesn't walk off by herself. The effort that is required to pull her off is zero, which you you know she's not going to go to the afterlife or the after afterlife, whatever the hell it is, yeah. forever. Yeah. Uh, so there's no stakes. At any point, did you guys feel like there were any stakes in this movie? No. Only verbally, <laughs> like they tell. Will they tell us what the, the different things that can happen or what's about to happen? But you're right. Like they didn't feel like you know there was like this slight mini chase scene. Beetlejuice is trying to get away from the ex-wife, and then like you said, Jenna's being put on a train. But there's nothing really stopping that from either her walking off or Olivia taking off the train and then accidentally going through the wrong door and 
going into the sandworms or whatever. But yeah, it does feel like there was never any stakes. Yeah. Like no one was in peril. No one was going no. to actually die. In fact, the one character that does die, it's dealt with so offhandedly and pointlessly. Mm. When Catherine O'Hara's character yes. you find out she actually is dead. Yeah. At the yeah. end, when they're like walking off, like, what happened? She's like, oh, I was the victim of a scam. And it's like, hang on, are we is, seriously, are we just letting this happen? Is she just dead now? That's she's it. Dead. She's just dead. Yeah. And no one, like, they're almost like, oh, you. Yeah. Like, yeah. no one even really seems upset. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Concerned no. that this woman just died mm. and is now like, what? And it was what? such a wasted opportunity. I was speaking to a friend of mine and he said she should have been killed by her artwork because it at least would yes. have thrown back to the first movie when she's like, I don't want to die like this. And then nothing happened. Snakes. Like, yeah, that seemed really weird. Coming. Well, all of these ideas and this, uh, I think this is part of what has become a bit of a recurring theme with Tim Burton is he has ideas. He's an idea mm. machine and he's a visual genius. The stuff this man can create with his mind is just or inspiring, but I think he has crossed over. He is an artist now. He is not a, a visual artist. He's an artist. He can create beautiful looking things that are awe inspiring and that are captivating and that are far beyond the capabilities of most people alive on the planet. I think what he's lost is his ability to put them in a straight line one after the other and tell us a story because we get the asps scene, which is on its own, beautifully constructed. She decides she's going to do this this Egyptian ceremony for the death and she is going to get these asps and they've been defanged and then they weren't and they bite her, which the way that they played that was, again, too slapsticky and bang out of a bad SNL sketch. Great scene. But in the context of the film, what the fuck is happening makes no sense. You know, the, the ghost boyfriend who, I mean, the stupidity of that whole thing, the fact that we have this character who appears over halfway through the movie who then turns out to kind of be the villain and yep. also the centre of the only part of this movie that I guess you could creatively call a plot. But you know what it felt like, that whole storyline? It just felt like the episode of Tim Burton's show Wednesday with General yes. Ortega because is... the guy turns out to be sort of, not spoiler alert, but a villain in that as well, and it felt very similar. I'm yep. very glad you brought this up, Michelle. Mm. I'm very, very glad you brought this up <laughs> because what this movie ultimately feels like to me is the first five episodes of a Beetlejuice TV show crammed into one movie. Because you have so And he's just come off doing... Did he do the first four episodes? I think he directed of Wednesday. He didn't do every episode, but he directed the first four and he was the EP and he ran it. And he said, as he was making it, I'm done with movies. I'm not making movies anymore. I'm finished with making movies. And I was like, good. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> good, good decision. Like, you know, know when it's time to hang your hat up. I will second that. <laughs> and I liked the Wednesday show. I was like, maybe yeah, this too. is your bag now. Maybe what you need is a smaller budget, a smaller environment, contained stories where you're like, you, you can't do all that crazy shit, Tim, because you've only got like 40 minutes, minutes <laughs> yeah. and we only have $10 million for this episode. That's it. That's the budget. So, and the next episode has to be a bottle episode. It's got to be like 90% talking because we, we ate the budget in episode three. Like, I think that works for him. And then he came back and did this and he just did a whole season of a TV show in one movie, but didn't actually bother to pay off any mm -hmm. of the storylines. Like the, the, the Willem Dafoe character is great as an idea, but he has nothing to do. Like, wouldn't it be so much more interesting if instead of trying to protect Beetlejuice, he was hunting him. Yes. Like, get rid of the wife and have the the underground the, the underworld cop chasing Beetlejuice, and then something happens, and Beetlejuice this time needs to come to Lydia for help, and he needs a human to help him because he's about to get fucking busted by the underground underworld popo, mm -hmm. and that it's a it's a reversal of the first one. She decides she's going to help him because concurrently. She's having these horrible problems with her daughter. And maybe her, instead of having a stupid ghost boyfriend, maybe her daughter is like trying a flatliners thing to kill herself and resurrect herself because she thinks if she goes to the underworld, she can find her dad mm. because her mum, for whatever reason, can't. I mean, there's some. I keep remembering all the fucking parts of this movie that just drove me insane. 
Like there's no, we haven't talked at all. There's no Gina Davis or Alec Baldwin in this movie. No, they, they crossed over because of a loophole, but what the hell was the loophole? No yeah, they didn't explain that. that. And no, I they prefer- didn't explain it. What they no. literally say in the movie when they say that is that Astrid goes, that's convenient. Yes. Like no shit it's convenient because you can't de-age Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis back to how they looked in 88. But they could have done that as the claymation. Get rid of the dead Oh, I hated the claymation dad. so much. Yeah, me too, it. but at least explain where the hell they went. Oh, my God. But, you know yeah, they movie... just... Sorry, this movie had... So I forgot much... about the claymation. <laughs> how? Claymation plane crash. Because obviously, oh. I mean, the elephant in the room is they, they had yeah. to get rid of the Jeffrey Jones character, even though that actor is still alive, because the actor himself, Jeffrey Jones, has been convicted of horrible, horrible crimes, mm. mostly involving very yucky things I don't want to talk about. But he is persona non grata. He can't be back in the movie. Mm-hmm. They had to get rid of him. Brilliant choice to kill him off. Even, I think, a good choice to have his death be the thing that reunites the family. Yes. Bizarre choice to then continue to make his character a major character throughout the movie. Yes just don't have a head and then to go the lengths they went to to remove the character's head to only do claymation for the flashback flashback because they don't want to acknowledge him and then still put his fucking photo on the gravestone yeah. mm-hmm. I mean, what kind of mixed messages are you sending you could just have his name you could just have it you don't yeah. need to put his picture there's absolutely no need to put his picture we we all know why he's not in the movie mm. We all know that in this movie, we're all just going, okay, it's not Jeffrey Jones. It's the character. Mm-hmm. So we don't even have to think about him. And then, nope, there's his mug right there, mm-hmm. smiling as Catherine O'Hara mourns over the loss of this amazing man. It's like, what? Tim, Tim, are you trying to tell us mm-hmm. that you actually are really sad that Jeffrey Jones isn't in this movie because he's a great man and you miss him? I'm not saying that's what Tim Burton is saying. I'm saying I'm getting mixed messages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because... It feels like you want to get rid of him, but also just keep him around and give him a cuddle. Yeah, so we, it, it, I found it weird. I, I was going in expecting that there'd be no reference, or he, similar to what they did, they killed him off, but they had his head cut off, or he was eaten by a shark. It made sense that that's their way of not showing his face and it, it, still referencing the character. But like you said, they use the claymation, so they're not using him, but it's still his likeness. And then all of a sudden, like you said, yeah, they put a photo of him on the gravestone, which they don't have to do. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like, I thought the same thing. It's like, sometimes I think some cancel culture goes too far, but I think in this case, it's justified and fair. He pled guilty <laughs> as well. It's not like he's maybe still innocent and got shafted. No, he no, no he's, he's guilty. And it's like, why did they have to even show his face? I, I thought that was weird. That was... It's different if he he was uh, an acclaimed actor that actually yet died, similar to we, someone we talked about recently in Alien Romulus that was brought back. But I, I, I'm like, I don't see why it's necessary. How many people actually have a photo on the headstone? Not a lot of people. Do you know who is a great actor who did sadly passed away? Glenn Shaddix, mm. a.k.a. Otho from the original, yeah. who yeah. is mentioned... Zero times in this movie. Yes. If you're going to put a photo of someone up and be like, oh, I miss him so much, put up fucking Otho's photo yeah. mm. and reference this guy who was one of yes. the best things about the original. Mm-hmm. Like, not even not even a portrait in her gallery yeah. to acknowledge he existed. They wiped... It's almost like he's the guy who did the horrible thing, not <laughs> Jeffrey Jones. Yes, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> like, if you were to say, oh, yeah, one of the guys in the original Beetlejuice, he really fucked up, and then you didn't know who and watch Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, you'd be like, oh, Otho, you dirty bugger. Like, you would yeah. never guess. It was the yeah, she, she even referenced, um, oh, I can't remember, but, like, the other, the woman that, like, came the to dinner. The real estate agent. Yeah. No, but yeah. there was, like, the woman that came to dinner or something in the original, yes. the art dealer. Oh, she yes, mentioned her yes. name as well. Ev- everyone. Yes. I wonder if Glenn Shaddix has said something horrible about or to Tim Burton, mm. and he's like, mm, you're not ever going to be reference in my movie <laughs> i don't i don't understand but did you notice that that the extension that he came up with for the house is no longer there too did you see that they got rid of that oh you're right it's gone mm. it wasn't there i was like oh that's too disappointing oh like that that was a very good modern addition but anyway that's <laughs> it's yeah. it's straight i feel a lot of what we're talking about i think is sort of circling the same thing that we all have this feeling that something is off what what do you guys think is the the, apart from the fact that it's a very overstuffed story, do, do you, what do you think is the thing that is really 
because it, it, for me, it's a, it's not just, ugh, this is a bit too many storylines. There is something that feels wrong. Have you been able to pinpoint for yourselves what you think is like off about this movie? There was just so much, Sean will be very proud of this word, exposition. Did you notice that? They just kept fucking explaining things. And I was like, <laughs> all you have to do is watch the original. Shut up. <laughs> yes. I don't disagree with that, but I feel like we're in this generation now where they're trying to make movies where someone can go and see a sequel without seeing the first one, like Angus's friend. And mm. I agree, Michelle, that sucks. I think you want people to go back and look at the back catalogue and see the original movie and go in, you know, um, you know, having some knowledge. But I think that's unfortunately what they do now. They think, well, again, I know there's a marketing person somewhere at Universal or Warner Brothers or wherever, whoever did this movie, that is sitting in an office going, we just need Jenna Ortega, we need this person, it doesn't matter, we're going to chuck them all in this movie and that will bring people through the, you know. But it was also the blatant person. references to Jenna Ortega's character saying, oh, I used to dress up as Edward Munch's The Scream and I was like, we yeah. get it, you're in a yeah. Scream movie, like, <laughs> yeah. let it go. That, was, that actually was funny. I was surprised <laughs> they didn't even just say, oh, I used to dress up as Ghostface. But yes. Yeah. There was one joke in this that, that really got me once I realised what they were doing and then I continue to love it so, so much because it's so stupid. Is every Baby time... Baby Beetlejuice? I, that was... I didn't mind that. I didn't like it at first and then when they did that weird ending thing, I was like, mm. I hope this is the actual ending. I hope this is... And then they, <laughs> they bitched out and I was like, ah, but I did kind of like it. No, it's every time Willem Dafoe's character enters a scene, his assistant walks in and hands him a paper cup of coffee. Yes. And then just steps every time, every time. And I loved it right up until the very last time when they cut to the, the trash the can in his office and it's overflowing. And I was like, we got it. We got the joke and yeah. you killed it. You were like, yeah. get it? Because every time he gets coffee, do you guys get it? Like, yeah, we got it. That was funny because <laughs> it was absurd. Now it's not absurd anymore. It's just a thing. It's just too much coffee and that's not as funny anymore. But up until that point, that was, that was really good. What I think, one of the things that I think I pinpointed as I was watching it and then have really confirmed myself afterwards that is lacking in this is I got really excited uh, about the, the announcements when they were talking about who's coming back. The announcement that got me not as excited as the cast, but really excited was Danny Elfman was back to do the score yeah. because Danny Elfman's scores are, I think, as iconic as anything that Tim Burton has put on the screen. Uh, Batman, Batman Returns, Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, Sleepy Hollow, like the big movies that, that Tim Burton has done. I'm pretty sure he even did Planet of the Apes. And all. That's, uh, I mean, whether you like that movie or not, the soundtrack's pretty decent. Well, the, And that's the thing. Danny Elfman is always great. And he's, he's in partnership with Tim Burton. He really is the ears to Tim Burton's eyes. You don't need to hear the dialogue in a lot of the scenes. In fact, there are some of the best scenes in Tim Burton movies have no dialogue. They are just Tim Burton's crazy imagery and Danny Elfman's crazy music coming together. These two beautiful weirdos making this perfect symmetry. There is fuck all Danny Elfman music in this movie. Mm. It is weird needle drop tracks of like pop songs in some point. Like when General Ortega is riding her bike around, there's like actual pop songs playing. I was like, I don't think that's ever happened in a Tim Burton movie before. I don't think he's ever had like a, a modern song or a, 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 like a non-diegetic song that was just there as score soundtrack music and not in the world to actually help propel the story. I mean, the obvious one is Deo in the original Beetlejuice. Yeah. That's the kind of times he puts literal songs in his movies. The rest of the times it is, it's, it's, it's Danny Elfman's music. That is the mm. thing that is underscoring everything that is giving you that Tim Burton feel. I didn't hear that. So I didn't feel like I was in, Tim Burton's Beetlejuice. I felt like I was an imposter's Beetlejuice, even though it's a Tim Burton movie. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that just goes to what I was saying before, where he's kind of forgotten a bit how to make movies, because yeah. if he went back and watched his first, just his first five movies, I think he'd be like, oh, you know what's really important in my movies is Danny Elfman's score. Mm -hmm. I should use that a lot. Mm. Um, because it, it's, it's off. And, and you brought it up a little bit, Michelle, the, um, uh, MacArthur Park song at the end, the finale with them singing and dancing around the cake. Did you did you enjoy that at all, Michelle? No, no. Just, just... no. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't a fan either. I I felt like it just wasn't the right song. It just no, not felt at all. so out of place. When they played it in the opening credits, I got nervous because that's what they do in Beetlejuice. 
in in the opening yeah. of Beetlejuice when they're playing the opening oh, score. There's like yeah. a little faint, yeah, just just blended in really subtly. Just Dale. it's kind of mixed in and then it goes away. Yeah. And when they started MacArthur Park, I was like, "Is this is this going to be the Dayo moment?" And it fucking was. It was the mm-hmm. big the big finale, just replicating what they did in Beetlejuice, but not as well. What I will say for that moment is. Michael Keaton is having the fucking time of his life. And every time he was on camera, I was like, uh, that's all I need, baby. You, I don't even need him to be Beetlejuice. It was like, you just be as happy and as insane as you are now on camera and I'll watch it any day of the week. That's all I need is, is Michael Keaton just fucking going ham to an insane old song. I think it's the Neil Diamond version, if I'm not mistaken, of MacArthur Park, which is some... If, if if people are listening, they're like, what the fuck is that? Get on Spotify or YouTube or wherever it is and listen to the song MacArthur Park. It's this insanely long, complicated song about leaving a cake out in the rain. And it's not a joke song. It's a real <laughs> earnest song about mm-hmm. life and love and loss and heartache. And it's fucking it's so stupid. But it, it doesn't land. And then they also, it's in the middle of, or, or in the middle of that is, you know, Catherine O'Hara is dead. Beetlejuice is trying to marry Lydia again. The mm-hmm. the ex wife is back and dead immediately. The boyfriend has confessed because of the truth serum that he's not a nice guy. Then they're dead with a sandworm, and then <laughs> everyone, all the influences are sucked into oh, their phones. I hated that which, so much. I hated it, but I did like that they just were like, "That's it." Like they yeah. never released them. They didn't magically come back when no, Beetlejuice true. died. It's like, no, those fucking people are all trapped in their phone yeah. forever. It's shit. <laughs> good. Like, That's pretty good. Cool. I did hate all that stuff. I hated everything to do with the, the Justin Theroux character, which is a shame because mm. I love Justin Theroux. I think mm. he's a great actor and I, I was excited that he was added to this. It's like, oh, he's got like a weird sinister kind of thing just about him that kind of makes you like, I don't know if you guys have seen Mulholland Drive, the David mm. Lynch film, but he's like, he's just uncomfortable to look yeah. at sometimes. Yeah. And in this movie, he's like going full out goofball. And I was like, oh, what? Yeah. Why? Um, I think he started off well, and then it was like he knew he was in a Beetlejuice film, and he thought he had to sort of ham it up a bit. Because I think I think I early think all on, the characters know they're in a well, Beetlejuice movie. Well, you know what I mean. I I thought he was a bit extra, and it was like uh, mm. that's where, like you said, you want him, you want it to be uncomfortable. Do you, do we know his full intentions? Do we know what he's really on about, or is he going to turn on her at the end and you know be the villain? But He's not really he needed villain. to be more He's of a dick as well. Like there yeah. was actually no reason for anyone to dislike him. Mm. So when Astrid, when um, I keep calling her Catherine Herrick because I fucking can't remember the mum's name. Delia. When Delia and Astrid are like, fuck this guy. It's like, fuck this guy, what? Fuck this guy who just walked into town to get boxes to come and help you pack up your house because yeah. you're grieving the loss of your husband. Fuck this guy who is just there trying to help you and care for Lydia, who clearly is not doing well. Fuck this guy who, like, just wants to, you know, love and care for someone. Why? Why fuck this guy? <laughs> like, I, as an audience member, I'm going, fuck this guy. Because I know he's a piece of shit as an audience mm-hmm. member because mm-hmm. I know what movie I'm watching. But at no point did the characters in the movie have any reason to not like him. No. So he should have been more of a, a dick. What You know what I haven't talked about because it, it, it comes and it goes, but it's evidently very important. Beetlejuice is still in love with Lydia and has been pining mm. for her <laughs> for all this time and has chosen just now for no reason. But wasn't he in the cartoon as well? Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, well, but are, are we calling yeah. the cartoon canon? Like, no, well, <laughs> probably not, but I do feel like, no, but for me, that tracked. I thought that makes sense yeah, to I me. Like I like that. that, yeah. But why does he choose now to start like her? showing up and haunting her? Because he there's doesn't... a new movie coming out. Mm. <laughs> and that's See, that kind of it. I it? Don't... Yeah, I'm not too sure. Sh... Again, there's only one movie to go off, and there's it's kind of a loopy movie when you think about it. Um, there's loopholes, too, that you can just get in and out of the afterlife but but it has I internal did, I, rules this one has no internal rules i know but i feel like isn't it the attachment to the house a little bit with beetlejuice and the whole um the model, the model? so that's why i think that's where it's reactivated the fact that she's in the house and it's but before she's in the house yeah. he's showing up when she's filming her tv show he's showing up when she goes to get lydia from school mm. no but is he really that's just he is, in he head. said yeah. he says yeah. when they go to his office oh, 
Okay. He's like, she definitely saw me that last time <laughs> yeah. that I went up there. <laughs> like, <laughs> I must so have that. He's doing it on purpose and he's doing yeah. it now before she comes back to the house. I just, I don't feel like for all of the storyline they had, that was one they didn't even bother to even try to flesh out. And they could yeah. have just said, oh, he's been haunting her this whole time. That's all they had to say. He's been doing this for years or something and that would have covered that. Or they could have waited. And I think this would have been significantly better if they waited until she was back in the house mm. before he was even hinted at. And I, I don't think... I, I really dislike that the first time that we get a proper Beetlejuice scene is when her and the boyfriend get... Like, he says, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. And she's like, no, and they get sucked in and they have a couples counselling thing with Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. It's such a flat, uninteresting reintroduction to this character from so long ago. There's no reverence. There's no, like, respect paid to... You know, you think about the first time when they yeah. bring him out and he's like, it's showtime. Like there was no, and that was the first movie. We'd only waited a half an hour to see him. Yeah. We've been waiting 30 fucking years. Yeah. And this guy shows up and it's just like literally him in an easy chair and he spins around and he's like, how's it going? Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah. it's, it's almost like as an audience, we're not meant to feel excited he's back. It's a mm. foregone conclusion so we don't even need to worry about doing a big entrance or a big like reveal. I I, I like this idea. I've heard this idea kicked around the internet a bit that because what they did with this movie that I simultaneously hate but also like is they chose to like put the restrictor plates on Beetlejuice. He's only in it about seventeen minutes again, yeah. which is the same as the first. No, movie. well, oh, it was funny because I thought you had told me this, and now I'm racking my brain. I think someone else told me this a couple of weeks ago that that was a stipulation also by Michael Keaton. He knew, Possibly. like, he was kind of like, no, 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 I think it works if I do roughly what I did last time, you know. I think I think it was even as low as 14 minutes in the first film. But it's like... It's 17 minutes and 30 seconds. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, I'll take your word for that. But it was like, I think I should do this about the same amount and that makes it work. Whereas something you touched on earlier is like, well, better just better just to put him in it more. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you there. Um, they probably could have beefed him up a little bit and cut back another character. But, well, I, but I having think said that, maybe the amount is the right amount. But you've got I to think hack... it's the right amount. I think it's the wrong distribution. Because I think yeah. what they did this time is they gave us 17 minutes of Beetlejuice in 17 one-minute spots. Yeah. yeah. And I think what would have been so much better is if they had have held it, mm. held, held him until the second half, you know, mm. wait 40, 45 minutes before like oh you can do things having look you can have again score you can have the Beetlejuice music playing to kind of suggest him you can have things happening mm. you can have Lydia seeing shadows you can have her remembering things back in the house there's mm. so much you can do yeah to suggest the character and to build the tension without actually having yep. him on screen and that but, is interesting to us as an but audience. I guess the other the other funny thing is when you're looking at um you know like you said, distribution of, of time and, and, and but it's also that comes down to quality. So you can have seventeen great seventeen great minutes of Beetlejuice for two like each movie, but if the other stuff around him is no good, well then that's a problem. But also the runtime of this is actually significantly more than last time. Mm -hmm. So I think the first movie is what eighty eight minutes, ninety minutes maybe. Pretty, have to look it up. But this one's sharp. getting pushing out towards the two-hour mark. And I think that's the other thing, too. You've got so many characters. You've got a longer film. Um, and so are you devaluing Beetlejuice a little bit? What are you, Angus, you, pulling off? You know what? It's it's not it's not that actually much? that far. I think it just feels, if it's an hour 32 for Beetlejuice, it's an hour 45 for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I think it oh, just okay. fucking feels it longer. It felt so much longer. It yeah. felt like it went forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And... The crazy thing is we're talking about not enough of these characters were fleshed out. There was too many characters. But I still think there was there was some boring bits. There was boring bits. I'm sitting here like almost lot. like, oh, oh I'm yeah. going to check my emails and delete some emails. That's I what like, I almost did too. And it's like, I never do that. But it was like, I'm like, I know I'm in the middle of a boring bit that's, like Michelle said before, like too much exposition or whatever. Or just nothing's really happening. It's just mediocre, just unimportant conversation happening. And you go, why, why is this not true now? <laughs> Anything to do, anything, anytime the priest was on screen talking, I was like, why are you in this movie? Yeah. Uh, Bern Gorman is the actor. I like him. Mm. I was like, why, why is this here? Mm -hmm. you, you, are, you are overplaying it so severely. 
and yeah. I also. I thought there was going to be something happen. sinister with him as well, or there was yeah, going to be you, something. You've got a priest. Mm-hmm. You brought a priest into a movie about the afterlife. Yeah. And at no point does the priest cross over or interact with the stuff happening mm. in the afterlife. Like that is pretty ridiculous. Uh, anything to do with uh, what was the character's name? Jeremy, uh, the mm. boyfriend. Yep. Mm-hmm. I just, I mean, really basic stuff. Like when he, he walks inside and you see the mum in the kitchen and you deliberately don't see her face. And you see yes. the dad in the kitchen and you do del- in the lounge room and you deliberately don't see his face and like, oh, they don't really leave the house anymore. I'm like, oh, so they're dead. They're definitely <laughs> yeah. dead. And yeah. he's probably dead too. And then, oh, and then I was like, okay, he's never leaving the house. He's fucking dead. I'm so bored. And then when it's like, oh, actually, I'm going to steal your soul so that mm. we you can come back because I tricked you into reading this thing. And I'm like, um... I have, I have a lot of questions here, and oh, I don't get any chance for answers because as soon as they start that storyline, Beetlejuice again. I've said this word before, and I'm saying it again. Deus Ex Machina. He just fucking shows up out of nowhere, magically yep. pulls a lever that sends this guy to hell. Yeah. For like out of out of the clear blue sky, Beetlejuice just happens to be there helping mm. them out. Like that whole storyline, it, it's almost like they got bored with it and like, oh fuck, just send this guy to hell. I can't be, I really can't be bothered. Can we, that we've just, no, we changed our mind. That's not the movie. That's not the movie. We take it back. We take it back. Sorry. Sorry. Barley, Barley. Let me rethink this. It was like an improv show as a movie. They kept coming up with ideas and like, actually, fuck that. No, no, no. Wait. Um, uh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Um, all right, uh, the boyfriend. The boyfriend is bad. Okay, yeah, he never had a girlfriend. Okay, cool, cool. And the um, uh, movie cop. Those words go together. Movie cop. <laughs> you'll put him in. And now, um, fuck. You know what? Ah, oh, shit. Yeah. What we should do uh, is a wedding. Uh, we we did that in the last one. Yeah, but this time we'll have a cake, and the cake will have <laughs> ooze, and it'll have wedding toppers, and they'll do a big dance numbers. Like we did that in the first one. I was like, yeah, but this time we'll do. And then the radio was just playing MacArthur Park. It's like MacArthur yeah. Park. <laughs> Yeah. It's like Mrs. Doubtfire coming up with her name as a movie. That's true. Yeah. It's like Tim Burton just looked around the room and was like, Beetlejuice <laughs> has a... Hey, my girlfriend's here. Beetlejuice has a wife. Beetlejuice <laughs> yeah. has a wife in this one. And mm. and Monica Bellucci is the, is the only actress who can play it. Come here, baby. You just got cast. <laughs> like, fuck it, hell. Go on, man. Oh, it's true. Jesus. <laughs> You know what's great though? I love seeing Danny DeVito in this movie. Oh, I mean, was a did part. you just Jedi mind trick me and, and read my mind? Because I was literally about to say, we haven't even mentioned Danny DeVito oh. with the green ooze coming out of his mouth for some weird reason. Because he drank bleach or something? I think, yeah, that must be how he yeah, died. He, was he, must have, bleach, he must have drank Drano to die and now he just yeah. drinks it for fun. Which is kind of this like a little funny, at least it made me think of the penguin. And the ooze coming out of the penguin's mouth in Batman Returns. But I so, did yeah. after I saw Danny DeVito, I got a little bit excited. I was like, "Are we going to see fucking Michelle Pfeiffer pop up in this movie somewhere? Are we going to have Batman <laughs> Returns?" That wouldn't be return? cool. Wouldn't it be well, so much more interesting if Michelle Pfeiffer was Beetlejuice's wife? Yeah, because those guys had fucking chemistry in Batman Returns. Yeah, that was hot. Well, the cra- now that you're saying Michelle Pfeiffer, the, the funny thing is with the Monica character. Like, I know we know the afterlife's a bit funny, and and there's the cartooniness of it, but all of her dismemberment in separate boxes makes zero sense to start off with. Why, why but then the, when she puts herself together, even just the way the hand, I'm thinking, oh, is that a nudge, nudge, wink, wink to Wednesday and thing? And then it was and then very she, Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, uh, yes. And then, but then she, you know, uh, not nail gun, um, staples herself Stable back gun. together. And it made me think it was very much the Catwoman suit, sort of the way it was sort of the weird cut together. Stitching. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And again, that scene, great, interesting scene. Yes. I didn't like the CG in it, um, mm. which does bring me to a, a big positive of this movie and something I like. Practical mm. effects galore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim yes. Burton, for doing practical effects galore, apart mm. from your weird claymation plane crash. The mm. rest of it, I thought, fucking yes. Great. Mm. You know, all the bobs were dudes in suits who were like puppeteers working yeah. that thing. All of the, the cool makeup effects on all the people who were the, in the land of the dead, the actual real sets that they had. Mm. Like, I was like, oh, God, yes, good. I feel like I'm watching something real. Yeah. This is beautiful. But uh, the sandworm still had that kind of oh, stop motion. So, oh, so CG. I'm glad you brought that up. I. Felt like the sandworm looked too clean to be. It didn't look as good as the first movie. Yeah, it was too clean. Yeah, and that, that's what I mean. I was like, okay, we know the sandworms 
completely a stop motion effect in the first movie. And I was like, oh, they'll do the same thing here. And I'm like, well, it looks a bit too perfect now. <laughs> like, <laughs> it just needed to be a 1988 version. <laughs> also, uh, the second movie of 2024 where we've had sandworms in it, which I think is not, not without noting. Uh, mm. they're, they're back back. It's the year of the sandworm. They're having a big comeback. <laughs> it is. And, and finally they're in. Well, I was going to say, like, I, did they, were they leaning into that for this film? May, I think a bit. Because I feel like we the, the, the vibration and looking at the sand and it moving and all that, it was kind of like, mm, are you going for the dune kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink? Because oh, I, and they, they fucked it again by, like, explaining the monster and, like, we're on one of the moons of Jupiter. It's like, who, don't you not? Who gives a shit? Yes, what are you talking yeah. about? You're just in a weird fucking dimension of sandworms. Why do you live yes. on a different planet? Yeah. Mm. Fuck. And that, I think it was also a June thing. It was like, hey, we're on a weird planet with sandworms. Yeah. Oh, okay. cool. We're going to have a Timothy Chalamet fucking cameo now. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. Him and Zendaya just fucking strolling past. I'm like, hey, guys, how's it going? But yeah, mm. like, dressed as Wonka to, like, harken back to him. Oh, yeah. Yes. To, to, to yeah, the, Tim Burton. The Tim, <laughs> the Tim Burton land. <laughs> Oh my god! So look, I, there are positives, you know. Uh, I think the the practical effects, the Danny DeVito, the uh, Michael Keaton. I feel like, uh, how do you guys feel at this? I feel like Catherine O'Hara and Winona Ryder were kind of like muted and restrained in this movie. It felt like they were really had the brakes on, and they the felt whole... very much like Winona Ryder was just sort of playing Winona Ryder. And I feel like mm. Catherine O'Hara, I've never seen Shit's Creek, but I've seen things was very much playing yeah. the character from Shit's Creek. Yeah, I I was actually thinking that um, there was def- – like, as soon as she had that comedic way of telling Lydia that her father had died, mm-hmm. made me feel very Shit's Creek. I know she didn't put on the voice she does for Shit's Creek, um, but it did feel like that was that character. And I was kind of like, I know Delia is not necessarily – what we would consider a normal human either in the first yeah. movie necessarily, like when it comes to her personality. But I think there was moments in this, I was actually thinking she was more like, um, and I, I can't remember her bloody character name in Shit's Creek, but I did feel like she was closer to that than she was in the first movie. If that yeah, makes she sense. was over the top in the first one, but this time she was like too over the top mm. in some of the scenes. So. Yeah, but I, I agree. I feel like they, they both, maybe didn't have a lot to work with and it was just like, oh, well, we need you back because you're important to the story, but we don't actually have a lot for you to do. You've just got to react to a dickhead fiancé and your daughter and this is what's happening. Well, that's she really didn't have a lot to do except to be like, I'm grieving and these are the different ways I'm going to grieve. And they had her in, her in there either not enough or too much. Like if that was all they were going to give her to do, sideline her a little bit. Don't have her be such a big character mm-hmm. or... If you if you do want her in there that much, have her fucking have something to do other than just be sad about the fact that, you know, he's dead, which I get is the big thing. Mm. But also, you know, why doesn't she get there and be like, oh, as a final homage, I'm going to turn this whole house into a statue of his yeah. head or something, like some grand artistic thing that lets her get out her crazy. And, and also... I felt like what was sorely lacking was any kind of conflict between her and Winona Ryder. Like, why weren't these two at each other? It was kind of, it's, it's boring that they get along so well. Like, great for the characters, but bad for the movie. So, I, yeah, I didn't really, I didn't really dig on that. Um, Did you like, <laughs> I will say one of my positives was that they, they, they went back to the Banana Boat song at his funeral, the choir was singing. Oh, that yeah. was good. Yeah. That was and I was like, oh, funny. thank God. I do feel like I'm back in a Beetlejuice film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I did like that a little bit. Uh, and it's, it was nice that it was nice to see these characters again. But I have to wonder, like, do you guys think it was worth making this sequel for what we got? Like, is, is 17 mi- more minutes of Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice? worth this movie i'm i don't i'm not certain either way which i I never going into this i never would have thought of being like no matter what like we're getting keaton as bill so who cares but now i'm like 
Like mm. Beetlejuice goes to Hawaii sounds like it would have been such a better film than this. I wish we went to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. I really like do. if you're gonna do it, do it over the top. Put him in it for like the whole movie. Make it Beetlejuice centric, not everybody else. Like the first one ended so well. Just leave it alone. Yeah, it kind of would have been interesting to see Beetlejuice be the main character in this movie. Like I know maybe less is more, but we did less is more in the first one. If you're yeah. gonna take a swing, yeah, why not have him at a resort and you know. Yeah, just absolutely. going crazy and yeah, I it's I don't I don't know. I mean the last the last time these guys made a sequel, we got Batman Returns. Last time Tim Burton and Michael Keaton got together, and like let's go again. We got Batman Returns, one of if not the greatest superhero sequel of all time, and one of just the best friggin' movies to come out of that era. And this time around, we get Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I feel like we we got a little. I don't know, I think we missed we missed a golden opportunity. Mm-hmm. Having said that, uh, this movie almost got dumped onto streaming. Yes, it was it was on the precipice of going to HBO Max, and Tim Burton wouldn't have it. And they said, if you make this movie for less than one hundred million dollars, we will put it out in the cinema. So he made this movie for ninety nine million dollars, <laughs> got a cinematic release. It is currently the highest grossing September release film of all time and the second highest second week for a September film of all time. So it's opening weekend, highest of all time. It's second weekend, second highest of all time. So maybe we're the assholes. I don't know. Maybe we didn't get it because it sounds like everyone fucking loves this movie. What movie is it second to? For a second week September release, mm-hmm. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can look it up. I just, I just know that that's its current, its current statistics. Yeah. Uh, it is, it is a juggernaut. It's actually being touted as potentially saving Warner Brothers' ass a lot because they have had a few misfires so yeah. far this year, um, and this one has come. They're already something like two hundred. They've already doubled their budget uh, wow. in in yeah. box office receipts. And that's pre streaming. That's pre. It's definitely, it's definitely a movie that I'm surprised for. At the end of the day, like Beetlejuice was very niche and wasn't a big, uh, crazy big movie at the cinemas the first time around. It found its audience on video, like we talk about a lot, Angus. Um, and it was one of those ones that has like people, like Michelle, picked it up somewhere along the way and absolutely adore it. And it's got its fans and. You know, the amount of people that cosplay Beetlejuice and buy Beetlejuice merch now and stuff like it's a big film. So I, I, I understand why they're advertising, but I'm surprised how much they've advertised this film um, to the point where, you know, the, the, the merchandise at the candy bar at the cinemas is there. Um, mm-hmm. That's big bucks. Uh, the Coca-Cola cups, there's competitions. I actually won a Beetlejuice bucket hat the other day. Um, like there's... I do feel like it's really out there. So it doesn't surprise me that the newer generation, and again, I'm not just saying it might necessarily be Jenna Ortega fans jumping on, but it could be the Wednesday crew, people coming across and, and finding it that way. But I do feel like it doesn't surprise me. It's made decent coin, especially if there's not as much competition as well. They've advertised the hell out of it. Mm. Uh, I feel like there's a resurgence with Michael Keaton. Uh, one own right, obviously, on the back of Stranger Things, just Winona Ryder, who when she signed on to Stranger Things, when she agreed to do the show, it was written into her contract. She would do the show, mm. but if at any point a Beetlejuice sequel got off the ground, they had to give her the time off to film mm. it. Yeah. That's how long they've been talking about this, and that's how much she wanted to do it. She was like, I'll do mm. it, but only if it doesn't stop me doing Beetlejuice 2, if that movie even fucking happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're right. You have Stranger Things, and you have Wednesday, and you also, I mean, and General Ortega. You have... Uh, I mean, a, a great idea. I get, like, I understand how people are walking in the door to this movie. I am confused. It's currently got a 77% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and an 81% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. That confuses me a bit because I feel like a lot of the critics, the stuff that I've read and listened to, they all have the same opinion as us, is that how many fucking plot points do you need in a movie? Mm. And what the hell happened? Um, but everyone seems to be forgiving it. Yeah. yeah, I've seen so many people say it's amazing. You can't say bad things about Beetlejuice too. Like people, our like not just the Wednesday fans, but like people around sort of our generation that grew up with the original love this movie, and I don't get it. Mm. So, well, I, people I've talked because I, I really wanted to try and understand. Because, like I said, as I was watching the movie, I was like, 
come on, man, enjoy it, enjoy it. Like, let's have fun. And some people I've spoken to said, literally said they're like, I don't care that the story is kind of bad because what this movie is, is an opportunity to see some crazy, like essentially monsters, some crazy character effects on stage, to see Michael Keaton go crazy, to be back in that world, to experience something that is so different from everything else. And that's that's like yeah. Beetlejuice's defining characteristic as a film, and I guess now as a sequel. You cannot say that it is anything else. But I, I mean, the original, you can't say is like anything else. And the sequel, I say, you cannot say that maybe 80% of it is like anything else. 20% of it is quite literally an episode of Wednesday. But the rest of mm. it is not like anything else. And that is, I appreciate as someone who gets so friggin' frustrated seeing so many fucking movies being like, oh, this again. Okay, great. It was nice that, you know, it was like, I had no idea what was going to happen throughout that movie. And I think that's because they had no idea what was going to happen in that movie. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was great to kind of get to the end and be like, well, that was fucking wild. Mm. Uh, I didn't necessarily enjoy the ride, but it was a ride. Mm. It was a, a, a weird fucking madcap kind of adventure in the style that doesn't really happen in a lot of mm-hmm. cinemas. It's not safe in the way that a lot of sequels are safe. Um, and there's that phrase that I despise and I refuse to adhere to of the idea of a lega sequel. Mm-hmm. It's just a sequel. It's just mm-hmm. the second one. I don't yeah. know why you need to add extra syllables. It's a sequel. But mm-hmm. the idea of making a sequel to a movie that is so old mm-hmm. um, and having it be pretty fucking crazy, that's a big tick. Mm-hmm. And I hope that because it is so successful, they do make a third one because I will line up and buy tickets to see Michael King be Beetlejuice again, no matter what. I don't, it, it's again, it, it is starting to feel a bit like Deadpool and Wolverine when they're like, they're going to make him do this till he's fucking 90. Yeah. And I feel like <laughs> he's, he's like 72 or something now. Like yeah. the man needs mm. to eventually chill out. But isn't, isn't that the thing though with Michael Keaton? Like he's sort of making up for lost time and he's coming back to these things. Like, I mean, he came back to do Batman again in The Flash, but also the Batgirl movie that, the Batgirl that, movie he was that got again. shelved. And um, yeah, so, and him coming back to Beetlejuice, it's kind of like, oh, like he was done with those characters a long time ago, but you know, water under the bridge, need a paycheck, why not? Mm. It was a bit of fun, why not? Um, yeah, I sort of felt like, you know, they've ma- they've set up enough that they could definitely have a a sequel, but I, oh, I would yeah. like I would like them to streamline it a little bit more and, and maybe really focus in and really get like you say a lot in the, in this podcast and just maybe just have another one run over the script one last time and work out what really needs to stay or needs to go. Um in fairness, I do feel bad now that you've given me the information that Tim Burton and Monica Bellucci are together. Uh, <laughs> I do think her character, I know why she's there. It's an interesting take that um, Beetlejuice has, I guess, an ex-wife or a wife that's after him. And I think that was possible good tension with Lydia if Lydia's back on the scene, but they just didn't marry any of that storyline up. No. And like no, so they had extra so... But then he probably got to a point where he's like, oh, this is probably too much. We don't need her. But now that I'm with her, I can't cut her from this movie. <laughs> so this is the problem when you work with loved ones in film probably is probably maybe not always have them in a film because it's very hard to put them on the cutting room floor. So, um, yeah, I, I think I aesthetically understand why she's in the film. I think it was possibly a good idea in early script stage, but... Um, if you have to cut anything out, like, yeah, you're right, Angus. It's just like they tidied that up really quickly. You know, I don't know. It was a good idea, just not executed well, which is, unfortunately is a lot of this film, I think. There's some good ideas there. It's just making sure they try to keep the best ideas in there and get rid of the lesser ideas mm-hmm. and then having a, a well-executed plan. And that's, unfortunately, I don't think what they achieved. No. No, not quite. I, it's also kind of a little bit melancholic that mm. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice has has fallen into this, and and by default taken Beetlejuice along for the ride. Fallen into this kind of like it's another one of the crowd kind of 
movies now where it, you know I, I did just say you know it's not like anything else but it does it is a part of that crowd of Tim Burton movies with like it's another rehash of something mm. that has been done before like he's only done four in his entire career he's only done four original stories Edward Scissorhands Corpse Bride Frank and Weenie which is a remake of his own short film yeah and Beetlejuice yeah Everything else he's done is an adaptation of a book or a comic or a remake of a movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's he, he doesn't he doesn't do. De- in fact, he's he's only currently listed in pro- in production uh, in in uh, in development project is a remake of Attack of the Fifty Foot Woman. So he's not slowing down mm-hmm. on just rehashing stories. Mm-hmm. And I guess part of me was really excited that he was going back to Beetlejuice because, like I said, the last time he did it, we got Batman Returns, mm-hmm. and that was sort of. I would say the crowning achievement of his original ideas. You know, if uh, I love Edward Scissorhands, but if you're looking at Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, Corpse Bride, and Frankenweenie as the original stories he's put out into the world, for me, Beetlejuice is the king by a country mile. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. it is yeah. incredible. I was like, well, if, if ever, if ever he was going to get back in the game, if ever we were going to get something just phenomenal from a very, very shaky recently director and a very old property in a film. This is it. This is the mm. moment. And now that it isn't, it's kind of like, well, the only movie of his that feels untainted now is like Edward Scissorhands. Mm. It's like, that's it. Like everything else he's done, there's kind of something, you know, I mean, the Batman films, I think, are unimpeachable, but also they are they're adaptations of comic books. And we're in a, a generation of mm. comic book movies now yeah. where there's just so many. Mm. It is. It has kind of become one of the crowd. It's like an Oh, and there's this version of Batman, and there's that version of Batman, and there's this version of Batman, and then also there's all the MCU stuff. And we we had we had something pretty special, I think, in Beetlejuice. Yeah. And I I wonder if, and I guess that's what I was asking before: was it worth it for that 17 minutes of Beetlejuice for those few moments where, like, man, Keaton's good? Did we lose more? By is Beetlejuice less special now? I mean, I know not for you, Kate, because you don't really mm. dig it. But is it, does it feel? Painted it all for you, Michelle, or do you be, are you like, you know what, fuck it, no, that's its own thing. Yeah, it's, I think I can separate them enough to still love the original, but yeah, it wasn't worth it for 17 minutes of Beetlejuice again. Mm. We'll make a short film and just do seven minutes of Michael Keaton and you don't need the two hours of all the other stuff. You know, I actually prefer the cartoon to this mm. movie. Oh. I wish they just had done another season of the cartoon yeah. and gotten Keaton to do the voice or something or Oh, yeah, you're right. Just make a short film of Keaton or just, yeah, for the third movie, let's go to Hawaii and let's have Beetlejuice yeah. be the main character. As sad as it makes me to say, like, I, we don't even need Winona Ryder in the next one. Like, no, I would miss her or have her, you know, bookend the movie. I, I really thought for a moment they were going to go, like, Hannibal Lecter on this and that she was going to marry him and they were going to be married because she was like, ah, actually, you know what, you're better than, you're better <laughs> than what I got going on with this fucking producer guy. That would have been pretty interesting. Mm. Actually, we didn't even speak about it. I actually love that opening where we think it's going to the house and it's actually her studio where she's got a show. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, Visually and I love amazing that. amazing thing. He's and great she, at creating cool fucking looking things. And I kind of like, and I understand why that didn't necessarily go anywhere per se apart from them talking about her and obviously the money attached to why he wants to marry her and all that sort of stuff. But I, I actually love the idea that she had a TV show. Yeah, I like, and I like to acknowledge it. When she's mm. talking to Delia and she says, you and I have been getting along really well ever since I sold out and did a TV mm. show. Mm. That's kind of, at least you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> at least you know what you're doing is fucking weird and kind of shitty. Mm. And maybe that's why you're so lost. Uh should they make another one? Should we should we be back here in two years talking about Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, shush? Simply for the fact that they can call it Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. That's the only reason. <laughs> I mean, it, it would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, wa- I wonder if, if it was in somebody else's hands, whether you get a... Look. I'm glad you said it. I'm glad you said it. Well, it has to be me. <laughs> look, don't get me wrong. I used to be a massive Tim Burton fan. I remember writing a big essay on Tim Burton films when I was in uni a long time ago. And I just feel like, you know, Beetlejuice in Hawaii sounds like a great idea, great concept. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to work with it. 
But does that require someone like Tim Burton? Maybe not. Unless they are going to use a lot of visual stuff, but if it's mainly the Michael Keaton stuff on in Hawaii, like literally on location, and you don't need necessarily the afterlife or whatever, like all of a sudden there's maybe not as much of a importance on the Tim Burton, uh, you know, look of the film necessarily, then is he somewhat expendable as long as you can write a really good story and compelling well, story for me? He, he said all along he would only ever consider making a Beetlejuice sequel if Tim Burton directed it. Yeah. He said he had no interest in making any sequels to any of the films he'd ever made except Beetlejuice and on the one condition that Burton was there. Yeah. Now, commonly held belief that he didn't come back for Batman Forever because Tim Burton didn't come back for Batman Forever. That that's not, is that's, not true. No, that's not true. <laughs> he was on board with Batman. Well, I think it was uh, uh, for a little while called Batman Continues was what Burton was going to call it. And then they flipped it around. But he was on board. And it wasn't until he met with Schumacher and started going through the script and looking at the storyboards. and went, you know what? This isn't actually. It was when Joel Schumacher said, I don't understand why it has to be so dark and sad. And Keaton went, that's his whole thing, and then he was out. It had nothing yeah. to do with Burton being out, and, and I think it, it would have it would have been a bit of this too. If they make Beetlejuice three and Burton isn't a part of it, when not if when they back up that truckload of money to his house and <laughs> offer him points on the back end, which is what he wanted from Batman three. He didn't want to just get paid fifteen million dollars. He also wanted part of the merch and part of the back end receipts. When they definitely do offer that to him for Beetlejuice three. I don't know if necessarily his uh, his allegiance to Tim Burton will hold as strong as perhaps he has uh, hoped it would. Uh, everyone has their price. Mm. Seeing how successful this movie is. But when you're 72 years old and you're the lead in a movie that is breaking box office records and you have been out in the wilderness for a little bit, mm. unfairly so, I think. Tim uh, Michael Keaton should have been a leading man his entire career. But yeah, but he went... It, he, he was a father first, though. Let's be fair. Well, no, he was Mr. Mum first, and then. Well, that, uh, <laughs> yes, very well. He was Mr. <laughs> Mum first. But yeah, he, um, he, he, he uh, it wasn't like he was neglected. He decided to step away from Hollywood to be a father. So. Yes, but I think when he chose to make movies, like he should have been yeah. given the the top level stuff mm, mm. his entire career. And there's a lot of years where you're looking like, why is Michael Keaton? not in bigger, more famous yeah. movies. Yeah, I get like that. Uh, yeah, uh, American Assassin. Remember that one? No, me neither. No. Um, <laughs> what about... I uh, remember when he was in Need for Speed and the Robocop remake in the same year? Yes. That was 2014 was a hell of a time. Uh, <laughs> or what about when he, he showed up in uh, ooh, post-grad the film that Alexis Padil did when she was trying to start movies after Gossip Girl. Remember that one? No. This is what I mean. Like, he, when he's making movies, you know, he was in Cars, but he's like the, the fifth lead in Cars. You know, he's, he really, look, this is personal feeling, but he should have yeah. been, he should have been fucking Lightning McQueen, you know? Mm-hmm. Where's, who is like, who is Lightning? Is that Owen Wilson? Owen Wilson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Who Jesus. I love, I love as well. I love Owen Wilson, but. But look, he, he the Keaton Renaissance is happening with some. Well, you said that he was in with uh, some stumbles. What was the? Oh, what you said that the movie? What? Uh, well, he did Birdman and Bird, Spotlight uh, Birdman, back sorry, to yeah. back. So he was nominated Birdman's for an Academy good. Award. And Spotlight's a lead. good, important film. He's good Spotlight, in that. Spotlight's incredible. He's great in that. He was also in Morbius. You know, so let's. Uh, not, yeah. See, let's not get I sort of, I sort of feel like some of those DC and Marvel movies when they're in them are like. Almost don't count them as films. Like he was obviously in Spider Man as the the Vulture. Yeah, and he's yes. great. He's great. He's great in it. But I sort of sometimes think they're the ones where you sort of forget they're in those films sometimes. But you know what movie he's so good in, and he took super seriously. He's so good in it. It's one of the great performances, but people don't probably acknowledge it as much because they don't know enough about the history. But he's the founder. He's Ray Kroc that started, well, stole McDonald's, but he went back and he actually um, watched all the, this archival video of Ray Kroc to get all the mannerisms down, 
all that sort of stuff. And I'll look back at some of that stuff too. And he's just amazing in that film as well. So this movie is being reclaimed people. You're not alone. People are, are coming out and there are founder like troopers mm. out there. Oh, yeah. Like he should have won the Academy all for this. This mm. is the greatest thing ever. Mm. <laughs> that was but not where I like... thought you were going with that. Wasn't he in multiplicity? Do you remember that one? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. And multiplicity is amazing. That is an amazing, but that's back <laughs> in the heyday. That's almost yeah. like the end of the golden era of Keaton. Mm. Like you look, he, before he was in Birdman, which won best film and had him nominated for best actor, mm. the two films he did before that were Robocop and Need for Speed. He did do Birdman and Spotlight back to back, but what he also did in the middle of Birdman and Spotlight yeah, the was do a voice. Oh. No, he did a voice in Minions. Ah, uh, mm. yes, he did. That's like, true. He, he's kind of, He's all over the place. And then he goes, the founder, and no one really sees it. And then he's in Spider-Man, and everyone's like, that's great. You were so good. And then his next movie is American Assassin. And then after that, he does Dumbo with Tim Burton. And then he does something called Worth. And then he's in Trial of Chicago 7, which everyone is like, Aaron Sorkin has lost his mind. This is the bad Aaron Sorkin movie. He's in something called The Protégé, which no one heard of. He was in Dope Sick, the miniseries, which people are like, yes. this is good. Yeah. And then immediately forgot existed after it stopped airing. Then it's his next credits are Morbius and the Flash back to back. Yeah. Like, oh, Knox goes away, has great reviews. People say it is amazing. You cannot watch it. I don't know where it is. You can't <laughs> find it. You can't watch it. It's one of two movies he's directed where he directs it and acts in it and plays like an aging hitman. I don't know what his weird fetish is. He's only ever directed two movies mm. and they're both about him playing aging hitmen. Um, but yeah, Knox goes away and now Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. And then coming up, I, I, I don't know, Goodrich. Anyone heard of that? No. Not me. Nothing like the sun. Imagine agents, citizen ward. Like, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't understand why it hasn't been easier for him. He's so good and nobody, nobody dislikes Tim, uh, nobody dislikes Michael Keaton. Mm. Have you ever met anyone who's like, ugh, Keaton, I hate that guy? No, but... No. I, but he's but beloved. Yeah, but like you said, he, he's 72, and I, I do wonder if it does get to a point where, you know, not that it, Hollywood's ages necessarily, which I think they kind of are, because females, once they hit 40, seem to fade out unless they can play a particular role. But um, men seem to have these roles, whether it's Clint Eastwood or Denzel Washington and Liam Neeson, they seem to still get work. But you notice they seem to do the same stuff towards the end. Like they don't get offered. There's not much variation in their roles after a certain point. And maybe that's where Michael Keaton, unfortunately, is. Even though he can act the hell out of stuff, he's just they're not. He's not getting the exciting roles anymore. It's just like he, he well, be, the one thing you... be the hitman, be the old grizzled hitman. We don't have Bruce Willis anymore. This is your new role. Well, he you know, cast like, himself uh... in that. But the one thing you can say about yeah. him is, if you look through the entire his career, he doesn't do the same thing again and again. And maybe that is no. the problem. Maybe yeah. he refused to stick with, you know, doing these similar roles. And as mm. a result of that, it reached a point where people were like, well, we, we didn't think of Keaton for that I, because he's there is no Michael Keaton type. I, I know, feel like the, <laughs> this is a whole other podcast we could talk about, obviously, <laughs> but could. I do feel like there's certain actors that I think we would all three of us agree are, are fairly good in doing diverse stuff, whether that's like the guys I've just said, Denzel Washington is so good in everything he does. Liam Neeson um, and, like you said, Michael Keaton. But now I think they've got to that point at the age where it's like they only get offered, hey, Equalizer 2, Equalizer 3. You're just doing the, you're the hitman now. You're just going to kill a bunch of people. And the same with Liam Neeson. You want to do Taken? Oh, that was good. Taken 2, Taken 3. Uh, and then every other – Liam Neeson is doing so many films, but every film he's just playing the same character in Taken, just in a different – now he's on a plane for this one. And then this one he's on a, a, a train. And it's like, what are we doing, Speed? And, oh, Keanu Reeves too busy doing John Week 4. We can't have him in Speed 3, so you're going to do this version of it. Oh, I don't know. That's I've always been angry that they never called one of the Taken sequels Taken Away. I think that would have been yeah. fantastic. They really fucked that up. Uh, anyway. just, just before we wrap this up, do you guys have what is your favorite Tim Burton movie? Cable, do you have a favorite Ooh, Burton movie? Oh, you put me on the spot. Um, well, I think uh, for a long time it was probably Beetlejuice because I think it was different and it was out there, it was cartoon. And again, you think, and all three of us saw this at a young age, so seeing that movie at a young age is, um, 
there's so much there because it's so different. That I think you do put it on a pedestal, and that's where you two obviously still have it. For me, it's just for whatever reason I've just moved on, or I've, I don't know. It's just like one of the first action films I saw at the cinemas on the big screen was Speed. So for for me, for a long time, Speed was like the pinnacle. Like if something didn't come up to Speed, it was like ah. That's just a rip off, or that's just not as good as Speed, or and then die, obviously Die Hard with the Vengeance and those couple of those films. But you sort of rate all those films up, but then there's so much that has come afterwards that I don't know. Nothing's ever really come close to being as crazy as Beetlejuice. So I would say that. Um, what, what about you, Michelle? You got do you have a favourite Tim Burton movie? Well, I think it's Beetlejuice, but I like a lot of his movies. Like mm. Edward Scissorhands is one of my favourite. Nightmare Before Christmas. I love Corpse Bride. Mm. They're sort of old ones you mentioned earlier, but yeah, Beetlejuice I think would have to be the best. Do you, do you buy into the theory that Frank and Weenie Corpse Bride and uh, Nightmare Before Christmas are a trilogy? And it's all the oh same character. Oh my god! Yes, I posted that on my Instagram like yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> the big thing that's kicking around. Uh, I think my favorite is, is I love Beetlejuice. I think my favorite Tim Burton is Batman though, just because I'm a big Batman kid. I think it's or also Batman my Returns. favorite. Batman or Batman Returns? Batman. I think Batman's number one. I think I think my top three would be Batman, Beetlejuice, Batman Returns. Yeah. Um, and I think that's it's like mm. it's about as neck and neck as you can get with loving yeah. three films. And I think Beetlejuice and Batman and Batman Returns could all duke it out to be in my top ten favorite movies of all time, if I'm being honest. Mm. And I think that you know Batman is is my favorite mm. Michael Keaton performance, but it could also be Beetlejuice on a different day of the week. Yeah. And I think that's that's the dilemma I find myself in. Is I look back and I'm like, these two creative people, when brought together three times have created some of the greatest cinematic experiences I've had in my life. And then they created Dumbo and then they created this. And I just, you know, maybe, maybe like Blink-182 said, this is growing up. Maybe this is yeah. it. This is what it is. <laughs> it's realizing that yeah. what you had in, in 1988. Yeah. Well, I mean, back. I mean, this, another thing about this film that makes me worried is that they've really confirmed this, the Goonies sequel where they're all coming back. And I was kind of like, Oh, please. No. I just don't think you come back. I just think it yeah. is so hard to to catch lightning in a bottle. Mm-hmm. You know what I think? I think you know. I think all we have left, uh, and I know this is a spiral, but I'll just I won't go into this. I think all Top we have left. Three. <laughs> no, no. I think all we have left in terms of like they caught lightning in a bottle and they left it the fuck alone. Really, is the Back to the Future trilogy? Yeah. Like anytime anyone's like, I remember like. 15 years ago, like, we should remake it with Justin Bieber as Marty McFly, and everyone was like, we are no. not doing that. No, no, no. no, we're not doing that. <laughs> no, there was, I think there was a legitimate push for Zac Efron at some but, point. Mm. And then that went away as well, and I think every time anyone's like, what about Back to the Future? Everyone's like, what about nope. fuck you? What about no? <laughs> yeah. What about we're never ever doing that? Mm. That's not allowed. And anytime yeah. they hint at it, like Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd put on the costumes and come out in some of the awards show for five minutes, yeah. they're like, Marty! And yeah. everyone's like, oh, yeah, you guys, you, you yeah. are it. And they're like, yeah, remember. And then they walk off and everyone's like, nah, we're not going to remake it. That's like the only one that I think is getting left on. Everything else is going to get remade. Or but even, even then, like, again, that's a whole other podcast. But uh, I, I, I think there's zemeckis and gail have a, a special hold on that that until they die they no one can remake back to the future so well let's but, start again, working yeah. on having them live forever yeah that's exactly <laughs> just have them frozen like uh Walt Walt disney, disney. <laughs> <laughs> good uh do we have any final thoughts about beetlejuice beetlejuice gang everyone just kind of looks a little bit sad mm. <laughs> i'm not sad I, I i like i said i i walked out not super depressed, but not super happy over the moon either. Um, I will say visually still I was wrapped. I felt like, did they even film it? Were they actually filming in the same place they did the original? Yes. I that was it? Yeah, that was the, the town and the barn. Okay, okay cool. Because yeah, I wasn't too sure because I, I, I'd heard different things. I haven't done my research on where they filmed and all that. But, again, it felt good to go back there. I felt like I was back there. I think the visuals of the underworld, um, sandworms, everything overall was pretty good. I just think, again, cramming way too many storylines into the one thing made it so not cohesive at all. Um, and they just needed to fine tune that and, and make some hard calls, whether it was getting rid of Willem Dafoe's character or getting rid of Monica Belushi's character. I don't know. It's just, they needed to streamline it and, and, 
just give Winona and uh, Catherine and, and Jenna more good content for them to work off each other because they know how to act those three women. Like, it's not, I don't know. I just think sometimes it's just a shame that they put these people in these films or get them and you get all excited and you're like, oh, they didn't really give them anything to work with. <laughs> anyway. Michelle, any any last desperate thoughts on this, this film? Two sandworms out of five. Two sandworms out of five. Wow. I don't even know how to rate it. I think uh, after having a week away from it, I'm like, I, I think I want to watch it again. I think yeah. I want to watch it again when it comes to, to streaming or, or Blu-ray or something and just sit back and let it just wash over me a bit more mm-hmm. and, and see maybe the, maybe there's something I mean. I'm still prepared to think there's something I missed based on how well-received this movie is and, and, and the amount of people I've talked to firsthand. Like, it was great. I think my final thoughts, like, this is a movie made for people like me and somehow it's not for me i don't mm-hmm. i don't know how that happened it was like they made a movie exactly for me and it's it's not for me so and maybe that's it maybe this movie just isn't for me and not every movie is and that's fine but um i, I even after talking to you guys about it now i'm still i'm confused yeah i, confused I, I think it, it's definitely like I know, I know you don't want to necessarily blow another movie ticket on it but it's definitely worth a rewatch to have a another look at it i definitely i actually will watch it again in the next week or so, I think. Um, but um, wow, well, school holidays are coming up. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll be like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to. The oh, city. actually, did. Do- <laughs> actually, it, 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 and now that you say school holidays, and I don't want to drag this podcast any out any further than we really need to. But um, what? We're all what done do, movies. <laughs> well, what, what? No, but what do you think about kids? Like, because I didn't think my kids had any knowledge of Beetlejuice until, obviously, they run ads even through the streaming or whatever the normal channels are, they must have been pumping the hell out of advertising on because my son knew exactly who Beetlejuice Beetlejuice was and he was like, I want to see that movie. And I'm like, have you seen the first one? And then that was another reason, apart from watching it the other day, going into the sequel was, is this, a, I can't remember if it was appropriate for kids. I, I thought it was a cartoony enough. It would be a little bit whatever. But there's definitely some stuff that said, you know, uh, maybe a seven-year-old, not so much. But... Um, I don't know. There's some crazy stuff in there, but I still feel like it's cartoony enough that maybe a kid would be okay with it. It just depends on the kid, the temperament of the and their. I don't know. Because then I was I thinking, I, I saw Beetlejuice when I was nine, so clearly I'm okay. Like, hey, and my from my ten year old has like an overactive imagination and gets scared very easily. But she yep. also sat down and watched the entirety of Wednesday by herself without telling me, and was like, "That was great. I love Wednesday." I was like, "What are you scared <laughs> by the monster literally ripping people apart?" She's like, "No, that was fine." So maybe she could handle it. So maybe I will show her Beetlejuice, and then take her to see Beetlejuice, and maybe I'll force my five year old to come as well. Yeah, yeah I'm going. Think- mm. Hey, you're gonna have nightmares about something anyway. Might as well be sandworms and dead people. Michael Keaton. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I'm any further along than when I started, but I had a fantastic time talking to you guys about uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Michelle, thank you for for coming back and talking Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice with us. Anytime. It was lovely to have you chatting again. Uh, Cable, always lovely to see your face mm-hmm. standing in front of a picture of your face and my face. Yes. Uh, <laughs> And listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm going to start saying this in the episode because we always forget. But for, for goodness sake, if you're listening to the show, we're 50 plus episodes in. If you like it, subscribe, leave us a review, mm. leave us some stars, tell people about it, share it on the Instagram reels, whatever it is you want to do, get in there. Uh, I, every time I listen to a podcast and someone says it, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And now that I host a podcast, I'm like, oh, that shit actually does help. <laughs> yeah, when sure people it say <laughs> It helps. It literally does help. Yes. It helps a lot. If you've ever heard the word algorithm, it helps. So yeah, please, mm. if you like the show, get on, follow us on Instagram, like, subscribe, all of those things that people tell you to do. Mm. Uh, and we will be back uh, with another sequel soon. And remember, friends, not all sequels suck, suck. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hey, Sequel Suck fans. I got my show on there for your films. I almost see Sequel Suck fans. Remake a quick warning. Sequel Suck. This episode is going to be a Sequel Suck. 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 Sequel Suck.